Tonight, I'll be sleeping under the snow. To stay warm, I'll be putting together a prototype heating system using just three items. Ammo can, copper coil, and garden hose. MacGyver would be proud. First things first though, I'll need to make a snow shelter. In any shelter, ventilation is important, which is why I made sure to add a couple small vent holes through the ceiling at the back of the hut. As fresh air flows in through the front door, the stagnant air is pushed out through the vents at the back of the shelter. With a snow hut complete, it was time to set up the heating system. Originally, I built this heater for my snowmobile camper. At the time, it consisted of two main components, a copper coil and ammo can. I filled the ammo can with water and kept it inside the snowmobile camper, from which I ran two hoses out to a copper coil, which was placed on a nearby campfire. 
Water then flowed out through the lower line of the ammo can to the coil, where it was heated in the fire and circulated back to the ammo can through the upper line. I also made sure to include a vent hose at the top of the ammo can, which allowed any steam to escape. This was a crucial feature because it prevented pressure buildup in the system. Anyway, the ammo can acted as a rudimentary hot water radiator, which did an excellent job at heating my snow camper throughout the night. Even though the outside temperature dropped to minus 17 degrees Celsius, it was a toasty 22 degrees Celsius inside. I'll be using the same heating system within my snow hut tonight, except with one major upgrade. A heated bed. Now before I hook up the heating system, I'd like to take a moment to thank Henson Shaving for sponsoring this episode. When it comes to their razors, I don't think you'll be able to find a more precise and comfortable shave. Here's why. They're made by a family-owned aerospace machine shop that has manufactured parts for the Mars rover in the International Space Station. Their razors aren't molded or cast in flimsy plastic, but are machined to aerospace standards as opposed to conventional razors which flex and vibrate over the skin causing irritation henson razors are securely held to an optimal depth and angle at all times translating to a superior shave that is consistent comfortable and clean since there's zero plastic to be found in henson razors or their packaging for that matter there's also zero wastage henson uses standard double-edged blades which are easy to find and cheap to use in fact, once you purchase a Henson razor, it'll only cost you around $3 to $5 per year to shave. For those reasons, I don't think you'll find another razor that is as kind to your wallet, environment, or your skin. Head to hensonshaving.com outsider and enter code OUTSIDER at checkout to get 100 free blades with your purchase. My plan is to attach this heavy-duty garden hose to the lower outlet of the ammo can and snake it through the bed, like this. I'll then run the exiting hose from the bed outside to a copper coil, from which I'll run a second hose back inside to the ammo can, completing the circuit. This time, I'll be using waterline antifreeze instead of water. I've used water before, but if the system is allowed to cool too much, the water will freeze inside the lines and crack them. However, the waterline antifreeze will prevent this from happening. It's important to note that waterline antifreeze is non-toxic and shouldn't be confused with automotive antifreeze, which is toxic and should never be used in a system like this. As you can see, I've installed a vent hose on top of the ammo can, which I will run out through the ceiling of the snow hut. Again, this is to prevent any pressure buildup. After moving the ammo can inside and connecting it to the bed, I went outside to connect the outgoing bed hose to the copper coil. With the coil's outgoing hose connected to the ammo can, and the coil's ingoing hose connected to the bed, the circuit was complete. Now it was time to open all the valves on the ammo can and let the water circulate through the system.
Immediately, the ammo can and bed began to warm up. Well, I'm settled in for the night and I'm feeling quite cozy. If you listen carefully, you can hear the sound of the ammo can heater gurgling away. And that's a good sound. That means that the heat is circulating throughout the system. If I take my uh, laser thermometer and put it on the ammo can heater, currently it's at 181 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 degrees Celsius. So it's, uh, it's a little bit too hot to touch and it's doing a really good job at radiating its heat out into the space. If you look on top, you'll see that I've got a blanket which serves as a barrier between the top of the heater and the ceiling. So my hope is that the majority of the heat will radiate out the side of the heater as opposed to going into the ceiling and causing it to drip. What I'm most excited for is the in-ground heating or the in-bed heating. Uh, so if I feel the bed right now, it's nice and warm, really nice and cozy. So I've got this heat coming up from underneath. That's gonna make all the difference, I think, for making me warm, but not heating up the space too much. Now, as far as how this whole heating contraption works, it all starts at the copper coil in the fire. So the water gets heated up in the copper coil or the water line antifreeze, and it runs up the line into the ammo can uh, then it exits from, from the, uh, the bottom spigot here into the garden hose. And as you saw earlier, that garden hose circulates underneath this bed. And uh, then it goes back out to the copper coil where the, the water is heated once again. So it's, uh, it's in this great big loop. But again, it's vented. So there's no pressure buildup. I stoked the fire one last time around 9 p.m. and turned in for the night. It wasn't long before I fell into a warm and comfortable sleep. Good morning. As you can see, I've got most of my stuff moved out now and I've packed it away in the sled, so I'll be hitting the trail really soon. But I wanted to talk about how things went last night and how the heater worked. I've got a few thoughts and some things that I might change, but otherwise everything worked perfectly and I ended up sleeping really well. I've slept in snow huts several times throughout my life and this is by far the most comfortable sleep I've ever had in a snow hut and it's due to the fact that I had heat coming up from underneath me. So initially when I had turned in for the night, I had stoked the fire up, but I figured I'd have to go out probably partway through the night and restoke the fire just to keep the heat going until morning but I ended up sleeping straight through until the morning. So I never got up to do the, to stoke the fire a second time. And that's because 
there was already a good bed of coals established underneath the copper coil. So even when the flames died down, I think around midnight, and the wood had been burnt up, the copper coil sat on those nice hot coals until morning. And uh, when I went out to check just now, those coals are still quite hot. So it carried the system through right until morning and I didn't have to worry about it, which is, which is better than I expected. So I'm really happy with that. Uh, now with this heater, it did a really good job. In fact, it did probably too good of a job inside this space. It threw out a ton of heat and even with the towel on top, uh, it still caused a lot of dripping above the heater. Um, thank goodness it didn't drip anywhere else in the snow hut. It didn't drip over top of me either. So I was fine, but it was kind of a little bit annoying to hear dripping as I was going to sleep. Although I knew that it was just above the heater and, and it would be just fine. So it ate into the wall a little bit, but it, that's not really a problem. Now, if I were to do this again, I would actually have this water tank outside the snow hut, uh, just so that it doesn't cause any dripping inside. And really what kept me warm was this bed. So I could put the water tank outside and have the hot water circulate through the bed. And uh, that strikes the perfect balance with uh, creating enough heat underneath me to keep me warm, but not throwing so much heat out into, into the snow hut that it causes things to drip. So that's what I would do. Next time, keep the water tank outside with a copper coil and just leave the bed inside to, to heat by itself. And uh, that was more than enough to, to get me through. Uh, anyway, I wanted to show this to you because this is actually how I gauge the depth of the walls while I'm digging the snow hut out. Um, when I'm digging snow huts, I always aim to have them at a thickness of about a foot. And so I use this dowel and every foot I put a piece of tape. I will take the stick outside and shove it in to the snow hut and uh, have the end of it flush with the outside. So if I see one or two marks, uh, I'm getting closer. But when I see that third mark, I know that I can stop uh, digging in that area because it's exactly the thickness that I want. And then I can stick the stick in somewhere else and, and then dig up to the, the first mark again. So I ended up uh, uh, whittling the, the end here to a point so it was easier to shove into the walls. And I was using my, uh, my new pocket knife from Cabela's. And I got a bright red one actually because when I'm winter camping, I like to have brightly colored knives and flashlights. And that's because if I ever drop it in the snow, which happens from time to time, uh, I can see it much easier. So I recommend that. Uh, pick yourself up a knife that is brightly colored, especially during winter camping, so that you'll see it. Uh, anyway, I think that's pretty much pretty much it, actually. Um, I think I'm going to pack up the rest of my stuff, and uh, I'll head out. But thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Until next time, my friends, stay safe, be well, and God bless.